11. Mind control. Off the deep end. I can still remember the email I sent to my agent. I'd made peace with the fact that I'd never reach a firm conclusion on Manson's involvement with the Smiths. I'd accepted that I had to break off my reporting and move ahead on my book proposal. I'd even taken a full week off, for the first time since I'd started in 99, to clear my head. And then Jolly West happened. You're not going to like this, I wrote to my agent, pausing before I typed the next line. But I think the JFK assassination is involved. I paused again. And the CIA's mind control experiments. I rewrote it a bunch of different ways, trying to make myself sound less insane. But when I hit send, I still wished right away that I hadn't. I might lose the one publishing professional I had in my corner. And at this point, I'd understand if he cut and run. He always seemed to hold his breath when I mentioned a new finding. But now I knew I was pressing my luck. What I'd written was true, though, and I was confident he'd understand. Through my research on the HAFMC, I'd learned that yet another shadowy researcher kept an office there and that his LSD research had clearer, more nefarious ties to the CIA than any of the others. At least his name wasn't Smith this time. He was Dr. Lewis Jollyan West. His friends called him Jolly for his middle name, his impressive girth, and his oversized personality. Pursuing West felt like the logical thing to do, but it also meant swimming deeper into the waters of conspiracy where, as near as I could tell, only the real nut jobs had wandered before me. I thought of Bill Nelson, the creepy Manson memorabilia dealer I'd once met at a Denny's. Was there something about the isolation and intensity of this work that appealed to me when it pushed most people away? I'd dared to tell my agent about any of this only because I'd found firm documentation for a long, whispered rumor about West. He'd used drugs and hypnosis to conduct behavior control experiments on Americans without their knowledge or consent. That allegation had landed on the front page of the New York Times in 1977. But West had denied it until the day he died, and no one had ever proven the charge. I could, and I thought it was my biggest scoop yet. West's resume was so chock-a-block with intrigue and mad scientist larks that even someone like Reeve Whitson, who behaved like a spy out of a GQ spread, paled in comparison. Born in Brooklyn in 1924, West had enlisted in the Army Air Force during World War II, eventually rising to the rank of colonel. He came to my interest when I learned that he'd accepted an office at the Haight-Ashbury Clinic from David Smith himself to recruit subjects for LSD research. Earlier in his career, West researched methods of controlling human behavior at Cornell University. During the Korean War, he helped to deprogram returning prisoners of war, who'd allegedly been brainwashed. His success earned him national attention. Around the same time, he achieved still more fame when he joined civil rights activists, like his friend, the actor Charlton Heston, as well as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in marches demanding equal rights for African Americans. Ironically, while he was fighting for the rights of some, he was suspected of infringing on those of others. His detractors alleged that through the 50s and early 60s, at Air Force bases in Texas and Oklahoma, he performed experiments on unwitting subjects using LSD and hypnosis. After John F. Kennedy was assassinated in November 1963, West psychiatrically examined Jack Ruby, who'd murdered Kennedy's assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. Not long before Ruby was due to testify for the Warren Commission, West examined him alone in his jail cell. He emerged to report that Ruby had suffered an acute psychotic break, Sure enough, Ruby's testimony before the commission succeeded only in making him sound unhinged. He could never fully explain why he'd decided to kill Oswald. Through the 70s, 
journalists linked West to the CIA's mind control research program, MKUltra. He denied all involvement, vigorously attacking anyone who suggested otherwise. He kept up those attacks until his death in 1999. Then, 74, he'd been diagnosed with metastatic cancer, and he prevailed on his son to help him commit suicide with a cocktail of pills. I had only a fraction of that information at my disposal when I first heard about West. But you can see why I felt I had to expand the frame of my reporting, yet again, just when I'd promised myself to narrow it. Nearly every psychiatrist and researcher I spoke to from Haight-Ashbury had invoked his name, often unfavorably. When I saw that he'd been accused of conducting mind control experiments, I second-guessed myself. This was not an excursion to be taken lightly. West had spent the last decades of his career at UCLA, where he'd become something of an institution, heading the psychiatry department's renowned neuroscience center. The university had named an auditorium in his honor. When I called the school, I learned that he'd donated his papers to them. But since no one had asked to see them, they'd never been processed. No one had so much as opened the first box. I would be the first reporter to look at them. For weeks, I convinced myself to leave well enough alone. There was more than enough to fill out my book proposal. I didn't need to involve something as vast and intractable as secret government-sponsored mind control experiments. But I had a gut feeling that something important was in those files. It gnawed at me. One day, I ran out of willpower. I hopped in my car and drove to the library. Soon, I was showing up every day when the building opened, staying for hours to read in the basement, and leaving only when they kicked me out at closing time. Faking a Hippie Crash Pad Late in the fall of 1966, Jolly West arrived in San Francisco to study hippies and LSD. The Bay Area had seen an unprecedented migration of middle-class youth and an explosion of recreational drug use. West felt he had to witness it firsthand. He secured a government grant and took a year-long sabbatical from his professorship at the University of Oklahoma, nominally to pursue a fellowship at Stanford, although that school had no record of his participation in a program there. West was a square tall, broad, and crew-cut, with an all-American look in keeping with his military past. If he wanted a good glimpse of the hippies, he'd have to blend in. He started cobbling together a new wardrobe and skipping haircuts. At least he had a solid knowledge base. The summer of love had yet to come, and the Tate-LaBianca murders were still years away. But West would effectively predict them both. In a 1967 psychiatry textbook, he'd contributed a chapter called Hallucinogens, warning students of a remarkable substance percolating through college campuses and into cities across the United States. It was LSD, known to leave users unusually susceptible and emotionally labile, as it caused a loosening of ego structure. That language was reminiscent of the reprogramming spiel that Charles Manson would soon develop, urging his acid-tripping followers to negate their egos. When West cautioned against the LSD cults springing up in America's bohemian quarters, he described exactly the kind of disenchanted wanderers who'd flock to a personality like Manson's in the years to come. West had a hunch that alienated kids with a pathological desire to withdraw from reality, would crave shared forbidden activity in a group setting to provide a sense of belonging. Another paper by West, 1965's Dangers of Hypnosis, foresaw the rise of dangerous groups led by crackpots who hypnotized their followers into violent criminality. Contrary to the prevailing science at the time, West asserted that hypnosis could make people so pliable that they'd violate their moral codes. Scarier still, they'd have no memory of it afterward. Just because such outcomes were rare, he argued, didn't mean they were impossible. 
West cited two cases to back up his argument. A double murder in Copenhagen committed by a hypno-programmed man and a military offense induced experimentally at an undisclosed U.S. Army base. He personally knew of two other instances, and he'd heard on excellent authority of three more. But he didn't elaborate. Later, I'd get a sense of what, or who, he might have had in mind. When he arrived in Haight-Ashbury, then, West was the only scientist in the world who'd predicted the emergence of potentially violent LSD cults. How had he learned so much about acid? You'd never know from his published writing that he'd conducted innumerable experiments with it. In San Francisco, he hoped to conduct more still. In the Haight, West found a group of kindred spirits at David Smith's new clinic where plenty of shrinks from the straight world were basking in hippiedom. Getting his bearings at the HAFMC, he arranged for the use of a crumbling Victorian house on nearby Frederick Street, where he opened what he described as a laboratory disguised as a hippie crash pad. This would serve as a semi-permanent observation post, granting him an up-close and personal look at the youth. He installed six graduate students in the pad, telling them to dress like hippies and lure itinerant kids into the apartment. Passers-by were welcome to do as they pleased and stay as long as they liked, as long as they didn't mind grad students taking copious notes on their behavior. The pad opened in June 1967, at the dawn of the Summer of Love. West took pains to ensure that it felt realistic decorating it with posters, flowers, and paint. Thus was born the Haight-Ashbury Project, as he called it, or HAP for short. For the next six months, he undertook an ongoing program of intensive interdisciplinary study into the life and times of the hippies. To drum up hippie business, West stopped by the HAFMC, where David Smith could furnish willing subjects. Smith even gave him an office. Having a nationally recognized researcher like West working out of the HAFMC would attract sorely needed government funding. We helped him with research, Smith told me. He was sympathetic to West's project, even though he admitted that he never bothered to find out what it was or what its objectives were. He assumed that West, like himself, was diagnosing psychedelic patterns in the counterculture trends that others had dismissed as boorish fads. They came over and interviewed kids that came into our clinic, Smith said of West and his students. He wanted to know, what is a hippie? Smith reminded me that this was a very new population. The fact that large numbers of white middle-class kids would use illicit drugs was a total mind-blower. Who was paying for all this? According to records in West's files, his crash pad was funded by the Foundation's Fund for Research in Psychiatry, Inc., which had bankrolled a number of his other projects, too, across decades and institutions. For reasons soon to be clear, I concluded that the Foundation's Fund was a front for the CIA. This wouldn't have been the agency's first disguised laboratory in San Francisco. A few years earlier, the evocatively titled Operation Midnight Climax had seen CIA operatives open at least three Bay Area safe houses disguised as upscale bordellos, kitted out with one-way mirrors and kinky photographs. A spy named George Hunter White and his colleagues hired prostitutes to entice prospective Johns to the homes, where the men were served cocktails laced with acid. White scrupulously observed the ensuing activities, whatever they were. The goal was to see if LSD, paired with sex, could be used to coax sensitive information from the men. Something of a psychedelic honeypot experiment. White so enjoyed the proceedings that he had a portable toilet and a mini-fridge installed on his side of the mirror, so he could watch the action and swill martinis without taking a bathroom break. He later wrote to his CIA handler, I was a very minor missionary, actually a heretic, but I toiled wholeheartedly in the vineyards because it was fun, fun, fun.
Where else could a red-blooded American boy lie, kill and cheat, steal, deceive, rape, and pillage with the sanction and blessing of the All-Highest? Pretty good stuff, brother. West knew better than to commit such sentiments to paper, but by 1967 he'd toiled wholeheartedly in the vineyards too. Before he moved to the hate, he'd supervised a similar study in Oklahoma City, hiring informants to infiltrate teenage gangs and engender a fundamental change in basic moral, religious, or political matters. The title of the project was Mass Conversion. As I was soon to see, its funds came from Sidney J. Gottlieb, the head of the CIA's MK Ultra program. In other words, as I said to David Smith, it was all but certain that Jolly West came to the hate to answer a more ignoble question than what is a hippie. That would be a cover project, I told Smith. Oh, shit, he said. Is this an asphalt Sherwood forest? What was Jolly West really up to in San Francisco? Hanging out at his crash pad and roaming the streets of the hate, he tried to pass as an apostle of free love. But few were fooled. Bob Conrich, a co-founder of the HAFMC, saw through the ruse right away. West walked into the clinic one day, and my first reaction was that he'd read too many Tim Leary interviews, Conrich wrote to me. West was a careerist in hippies' clothing. What I remember is his enthusiasm for the whole summer of love thing, which seemed exaggerated and insincere. Conrich was right. West's excitement was a sham. His feelings for hippies dripping with condescension. He soon concluded that the constellation of sex, drugs, and communalism shining over the hate that summer was doomed to fail. The very chemicals they use will inevitably enervate them as individuals and bleed the energies of the hippie movement to its death. He called this an ineffable tragedy. But it's hard to imagine he saw it that way. For West, the failure of 60s idealism was the most desirable outcome, one that he was quite possibly working toward. A copy of his resume from this period hints at the thrust of his research. He was at work on a book called Experimental Psychopathology, The Induction of Abnormal States, but he never published it. Nor, on the surface, would the induction of abnormal states dovetail with the stated goals of his HAP. By the early 70s, he removed the title from his resume and never mentioned it again. Stephen Patel, the forensic psychologist, worked briefly with West in 1968 and referred to him as the only benevolent psychopath I ever met. The man could charm the pants off of anyone and manipulate people into doing all sorts of things they didn't want to do. At the hap, though, West's motives were so vague that even his charm didn't suffice. No one had a firm grasp of the project's purpose, even those involved in it. The grad students hired to man West's crash pad laboratory were assigned to keep diaries of their work. In unguarded moments, Nearly all these students admitted that something didn't add up. They weren't sure what they were supposed to be doing or why West was there. And often, he wasn't there. Unlike the grad students, he didn't live at the pad. But he wasn't putting in long hours at the HAFMC either. Those who knew him at both places, and elsewhere in his long career, recalled his chronic absenteeism. One of the diaries in West's files belonged to Kathy Collins, a Stanford psychology grad student who lived at the HAP pad that summer. The experience was a huge letdown for her, aimless to the point of worthlessness. She was getting paid to do nothing. When crashers showed up, no one made much of a point of finding out about them, she put down in neat handwriting. More often, hippies failed to show up at all, since many of them apparently looked on the pad with suspicion. What the hell have I gotten myself into? And what the hell is Jolly doing? It's like a zoo. Is he studying us or them?
When West made one of his rare appearances, he was dressed funny, like a hippie. Sometimes he would have friends in tow, costumed just as poorly. Collins wrote, The rest of us tended to look to them in trying to understand what we were supposed to do or what Jolly wanted. Their general reply was that this was a good opportunity to have fun. I gather that they did. They spent a good deal of the time stoned. Ennui set in. Hoping to feel useful, Collins and the others made inquiries about helping out at the HAFMC. They were swiftly rebuffed. Pressed for specific guidelines, West's exuded phoniness and dishonesty, suggesting that the students answer sweeping, high-flown questions about the hate, such as, Is this an asphalt Sherwood forest? She got the impression that this question had already been answered. At the height of her frustration, Collins wrote like someone trapped in an existentialist drama. I really don't know whether to laugh at Jolly or take him seriously, she fumed. I feel like no one is being honest and straight, and the whole thing is a gigantic put-on. What is he trying to prove? He is interested in drugs, that is clear. What else? Brainwashing with the love drug Collins was right. West was interested in drugs. His professional fascination with LSD was practically as old as the substance itself. And he was one of an elite cadre of scientists using it in top-secret research. Lysergic acid diethylamide was synthesized in 1938 by chemists at Switzerland's Sandoz Industries but it was not introduced as a pharmaceutical until 1947. In the 50s, when the CIA began to experiment on humans with it, it was a very new substance. Be that as it may, the agency was not inclined to exercise caution. Almost right away, government scientists saw LSD as a potential Cold War miracle drug, the key to eradicating communism and seeding global democracy. Its effects on individual minds were extrapolated onto groups, voting blocks, and entire populations. Among psychiatrists, artists, and curious recreational users, LSD augured a different sort of liberty, but they too regarded it with awe. Albert Hoffman, the Swiss scientist who discovered its hallucinogenic qualities in 1943, described it as a sacred drug that gestured toward the mystical experience of a deeper, comprehensive reality. The actor Cary Grant, on the advice of his shrink, took some 100 LSD trips during their weekly meetings in the late 50s, experiencing a rebirth and picturing himself as a giant penis launching off from Earth like a spaceship. Charles Fisher, a drug researcher who worked with David Smith, described to me the early perceptions of acid when trips were planned like literal journeys. Very few people took LSD without having somebody being a trip leader, Fisher said. The suggestibility from LSD was akin to hypnosis, and Jolly West, of course, had known well enough to study the two in tandem. You can tell somebody to hurt somebody, but you call it something else, Fisher explained. Hammer the nail into the wood, and the wood perhaps as a human being. It could result in some violent activity, even though LSD was considered a love drug. The global superpowers considered it anything but. Full-fledged U.S. research into LSD began soon after the end of World War II, when American intelligence learned that the USSR was developing a program to influence human behavior through drugs and hypnosis. The United States believed that the Soviets could extract information from people without their knowledge, program them to make false confessions, and perhaps persuade them to kill on command. The CIA, then in its infancy, saw mind control as a natural extension of communism, spreading like fire where the forces of unreason prevailed. In 1949, it launched Operation Bluebird, a mind control program whose chipper name belied its brutal ambitions and its propensity for trampling on human rights. In its yen to best the Soviets, 
the CIA tested drugs on American citizens, most in federal penitentiaries or on military bases, who didn't even know about, let alone consent to, the battery of procedures they underwent. Their abuse found further justification in 1952, when, in Korea, captured American pilots admitted on national radio that they'd sprayed the Korean countryside with illegal biological weapons. It was a confession so beyond the pale that the CIA blamed communists. The POWs must have been brainwashed. The word, a literal translation of the Chinese Xinao, didn't appear in English before 1950. It articulated a set of fears that had coalesced in post-war America. Soviets were using guile to force an evil philosophy on the world. Technology had destabilized every atom of human nature, and a new class of chemicals with unpronounceable names could reduce people to machines. The human mind, like any other appliance, could be rewired and automated. Once the Korean War was over and the American POWs returned, the Army brought in a team of scientists to deprogram them. Among those scientists was a young psychiatrist from Cornell, Dr. Lewis J. West. He would later claim to have studied 83 prisoners of war, 56 of whom had been forced to make false confessions. West interviewed them at length undoing the treacheries of the thought reform they'd undergone in enemy hands. He and his colleagues were credited with reintegrating the POWs into Western society, and, maybe more important, getting them to renounce their claims about having used biological weapons. West's success with the POWs gained him entree to the upper echelons of the intelligence community. As the Cold War bred paranoia, the CIA accelerated its mind control efforts, and West, I learned, carved out a niche he'd occupy for decades to come. Initially, the agency wanted only to prevent further brainwashing by the Soviets. But the extraordinary power of psychotropic drugs, particularly LSD, was hard to ignore. Thus, a defensive program became an offensive one. Operation Bluebird morphed into Operation Artichoke, a search for an all-purpose truth serum. Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, a poisons expert who headed the chemical division of the CIA's technical services staff, had convinced the agency's director, Alan Dulles, that mind control ops were the future. Gottlieb, whose aptitude and amorality had earned him the nickname the Black Sorcerer, developed gadgetry straight out of schlocky sci-fi, high-potency stink bombs, swizzle sticks laced with drugs, exploding seashells, poisoned toothpaste, poisoned handkerchiefs, poisoned cigars, poisoned anything. Mind control became Gottlieb's pet project. Dulles, convinced that the American dream was at stake, ensured that Gottlieb was well-funded, in a speech at Princeton University, Dulles warned that communist spies could turn the American mind into a phonograph playing a disc put on its spindle by an outside genius over which it has no control. Just days after those remarks, on April 13, 1953, he officially set Project MK Ultra into motion. The project's broadest goal was to influence human behavior. Under its umbrella were 149 sub-projects, many involving research that used unwitting participants. Having persuaded an Indianapolis pharmaceutical company to replicate the Swiss formula for LSD, the CIA had a limitless domestic supply of its favorite new drug. The agency hoped to produce couriers who could embed hidden messages in their brains to implant false memories and remove true ones in people without their awareness, to convert groups to opposing ideologies and more. The loftiest objective was the creation of hypno-programmed assassins. In their defense, CIA spooks weren't above experimenting on themselves. The same substance that held the promise of controlling minds and quashing communism was used in churlish office pranks with agents quietly slipping LSD into their colleagues' drinks to achieve much-needed first-hand knowledge.
A plan to spike the punch bowl at the CIA Christmas party was quashed when higher-ups reminded the office that it could cause insanity. The most sensitive work was conducted far from Langley, farmed out to scientists at colleges, hospitals, prisons, and military bases all over the United States and Canada. The CIA gave these scientists aliases, funneled money to them, and instructed them on how to conceal their research from prying eyes, including those of their unknowing subjects. Feeling that it was their patriotic duty, the scientists accepted their secret missions in defiance of the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. In 1949, at the Nuremberg trials that adjudicated the crimes of World War II, the United States adopted the International Code for Human Experimentation, a person must give full and informed consent before being used as a subject. MK Ultra scientists flouted this code constantly, remorselessly, and in ways that stupefy the imagination. Their work encompassed everything from electronic brain stimulation to sensory deprivation to induced pain and psychosis. They sought ways to cause heart attacks, severe twitching, and intense cluster headaches. If drugs didn't do the trick, they'd try to master ESP, ultrasonic vibrations, and radiation poisoning. One project tried to harness the power of magnetic fields. Operated on a strict need-to-know basis, MK Ultra was so highly classified that when John McCone succeeded Dulles as CIA director late in 1961, he was not informed of its existence. Fewer than half a dozen agency brass were aware of MK Ultra at any period during its 20-year history. When Gottlieb retired in 1972 or 73, the project retired with him. By then, it had been pared down to almost nothing as the agency focused on other ways to halt communism and sway policymaking abroad and at home. Still, when the Watergate scandal and the CIA's involvement in it consumed the nation in the early 70s, it occurred to agency leadership that it would be prudent to cover their tracks. Director Richard Helms ordered Gottlieb to destroy all MK Ultra files. In January 1973, the Technical Services staff shredded countless documents describing the use of hallucinogens, including every known copy of a manual called LSD, some unpsychedelic implications. MKUltra evaporated. Grandiose and sinister. In their haste to purge their misdeeds, the agents forgot about a cache of some 16,000 additional papers in an off-site warehouse. Even internally, those files would remain undiscovered for several years. But it was only a matter of time until the story broke. MKUltra had become fodder for rumors around Washington. In December 1974, the project finally came to light in a terrific flash of headlines and intrigue. Seymour Hersh reported it on the front page of the New York Times. Huge CIA operation reported in U.S. against anti-war forces. Three government investigations followed, all hobbled by the CIA's destruction of its files. When records were available, they were redacted. When witnesses were summoned, they were forgetful. First came the Church Committee and the Rockefeller Commission, each mentioned earlier regarding chaos and COINTELPRO. The Church Committee's final report unveiled a 1957 internal evaluation of MKUltra by the CIA's Inspector General. Precautions must be taken, the document warned, to conceal these activities from the American public in general. The knowledge that the agency is engaging in unethical and illicit activities would have serious repercussions. A 1963 review from the Inspector General put it even more gravely. A final phase of the testing of MK Ultra products places the rights and interests of U.S. citizens in jeopardy. In fact, as the Church Committee's report went on, MK Ultra had caused the deaths of at least two American citizens. One was a doctor who'd been injected with a synthetic mescaline derivative. The other was Frank Olson, 
a CIA-contracted scientist who'd been unwittingly dosed with LSD at a small agency gathering in the backwoods of Maryland presided over by Gottlieb himself. Olson fell into an irreparable depression afterward, which led him to hurl himself out the window of a New York City hotel where agents had brought him for treatment. Continued investigation by Olson's son Eric strongly suggests that the CIA arranged for the agents to fake his suicide. They threw him out of the window themselves, out of fear that he would blow the whistle on MK Ultra and the military's use of biological weapons in the Korean War. The news of Olson's death shocked a nation already reeling from Watergate, and now less inclined than ever to trust its institutions. The government tried to quell the controversy by passing new regulations on human experimentation. But scrutiny and internal pressure on the CIA continued to mount until the agency was forced to make an admission. It hadn't destroyed everything. It had come to their attention that thousands of pages about MK Ultra were collecting dust in the off-site warehouse. So came another congressional investigation, more robust than the last, with 16,000 additional pages of documentation at its disposal. Senators Ted Kennedy and Daniel Inouye subpoenaed a number of CIA spooks. Among them was Gottlieb, rousted from his retirement in California and forced to defend his actions before the Senate. Or rather, before some of the Senate. Gottlieb claimed that his heart condition precluded the possibility of his addressing the whole chamber. Instead, he was installed in an anteroom where he answered questions from a select group while the masses listened over a public address system. As the New York Times pointed out, Gottlieb managed to elude the lights and microphones and the crush of reporters waiting for him in the Senate hearing room. He was spared the sight of the incredulity that spread over their faces as he admitted that he had destroyed MK Ultra's files, not to cover up illegal activity, but because this material was sensitive and capable of being misunderstood. He resented the harm done to his reputation, and he was loath to provide specifics about MK Ultra experiments, saying that he'd never witnessed any himself. Gottlieb's destruction of the MK Ultra files was a federal crime. It was investigated by the Justice Department in 1976, but according to the Times, quietly dropped. His brutal courses of experimentation broke any number of laws, and his perjury that day did, too. But he was never prosecuted. He'd testified before the Senate only under the condition that he received total criminal immunity. As for those 16,000 new pages, they were mainly financial records. But a few more tantalizing documents found the CIA explicating its ambitions. Can we obtain control of the future activities, physical and mental, of any individual, willing or unwilling, with a guarantee of amnesia, they asked? Can we force an individual to act against his own moral concepts? And can an individual be made to perform an act of attempted assassination? Senate investigators condemned MK Ultra unanimously. Kennedy branded it perverse and corrupt an erosion of the freedom of individuals and institutions in the name of national security. Inouye called it grandiose and sinister. The CIA's new director, Stansfield Turner, swore that he'd sent all existing MK Ultra files to the Justice Department, which would mount a thorough investigation. Still, between the destruction of records and the subpoenaed agent's sudden memory lapses, Everyone knew that the full facts, as the New York Times editorialized, may never come out. The Senate demanded the formation of a federal program to locate the victims of MK Ultra experiments and to pursue criminal charges against the perpetrators. That program never coalesced. Surviving records named 80 institutions, including 44 universities and colleges and 185 researchers, among them Louis J. West. The New York Times identified him, in a front-page lead story no less, as one of seven suspected scientists who'd secretly participated in MK Ultra under academic cover. And yet not one researcher was ever federally investigated. 
Only two victims were ever notified. The Times had called MKUltra a secret 25-year, $25 million effort by the CIA to learn how to control the human mind. It looked like no one would suffer any consequences for it. Griffin Bell, the attorney general at the time of the revelations, told me the files never arrived at the Justice Department, despite Stansfield Turner's sworn claim to the contrary. Bell said they must have just fallen through the cracks. As for Turner himself, he told me he could no longer remember having testified that the CIA sent the files. I'm just drawing a total blank here, he said. I read his remarks back to him. I guess I did testify about this, he said. Somebody fed me the stuff and I played it back. The New York Times ran 27 stories on MKUltra, eight on the front page. But no one in the press corps and none of the senators involved followed up to see that the promised investigations took place. Since then, the program's bewildering significance has been engulfed many times over by other controversies. Receding in the rearview mirror, it looks like just another example of the CIA's megalomania at the zenith of the Cold War. Jolly West, CIA Asset When I started visiting the UCLA library, I had no idea that Jolly West had created a laboratory disguised as a hippie crash pad in the hate. I'd found early research papers of his, but not much else. And for a long while, my days in the library were fruitless. West's archive comprised 200 boxes, most of them full of ephemera. There were tons of press clippings. West had tracked the media's coverage of assassinations, the CIA, aggression in cats, psychosurgery, capital punishment, alcoholism among Native Americans, behavior modification, and the civil rights movement, among other subjects. I was intrigued to see many clippings on the Manson murders and papers by Roger Smith, David Smith, and Alan Rose. Part of the reason that West became my white whale was that, improbably enough, I'd already interviewed him once in 1995, a few years before his death, when I was still reporting celebrity features for us and Premier. I was doing a piece on the uptick in celebrity stalkers, and West was one of the scientific experts I consulted. When I'd spoken with psychiatrists before, I was the one who did all the talking. This time it was all West, who droned on for so long that I cut the interview short. Now that felt like a lifetime ago. As I settled in for the long haul at the library, my early certainty began to falter. My first visit had been on June 12, 2001. I'd leave the campus every evening wondering if I was wasting my time, having found nothing and gotten no closer to wrapping up my reporting. The basement of the library came to feel like my underground bunker. More than two months went by. I kept sifting and taking notes. On August 25, among a batch of research papers on hypnosis, I found them. Letters between West and his CIA handler, Sherman Grifford. I didn't recognize the name. So as soon as I got home, I began tearing through every book I had that mentioned MKUltra, hoping that it would jump out at me. In the first and most definitive of the bunch, John Marx's The Search for the Manchurian Candidate, there it was, buried in a footnote. CIA operators and agents all had cover names, it said, even in classified documents. Gottlieb was Sherman R. Grifford. So West really had lied all those years. Not only was he a part of MKUltra, he'd corresponded with the black sorcerer of MKUltra himself. Preserved in his files, the letters picked up midstream, with no prologue or preliminaries. The first one was dated June 11, 1953, a mere two months after MKUltra started. West was then chief of psychiatric service at the air base at Lackland, Texas. Addressing Gottlieb as SG, he outlined the experiments he proposed to perform using a combination of psychotropic drugs and hypnosis.
Enumerating short and long-term goals, he offered a nine-point list, beginning with a plan to discover the degree to which information can be extracted from presumably unwilling subjects through hypnosis alone or in combination with certain drugs, possibly with subsequent amnesia for the interrogation and or alteration of the subject's recollection of the information he formerly knew. Another item proposed honing techniques for implanting false information into particular subjects or for inducing in them specific mental disorders. West wanted to reverse someone's belief system without his knowledge and make it stick. He hoped to create couriers who would carry a long and complex message embedded secretly in their minds and to study the induction of trance states by drugs. All of these were the goals of MK Ultra, and they bore a striking resemblance to Manson's accomplishments with his followers more than a decade later. Needless to say, West added, the experiments must eventually be put to test in practical trials in the field. West's colleagues wouldn't approve of his activities. He yearned to cut down considerably the number of people who can properly call me to account. Because he'd been using drugs that were not on the Air Force list of standard preparations, he wanted to secure some sort of carte blanche. He would go on to suggest a number of security measures in his letters, including disguised funding, double envelopes, and false names. Next, West addressed a sensitive matter. Who would the guinea pigs be? He listed four groups, basic airmen, volunteers, patients, and others possibly including prisoners in the local stockade. Only the volunteers would be paid. The others could be unwilling and, though it wasn't spelled out, unwitting. It'd be easier to preserve his secrecy if he was inducing specific mental disorders in people who already exhibited them. Certain patients requiring hypnosis in therapy or suffering from dissociative disorders, trances, fugues, amnesias, etc., might lend themselves to our experiments. As if to prove his thoroughness, he affixed two addenda to his four-page letter, begging Gottlieb to get one of his superiors, a Major Robert Williams, transferred to another base. Williams was an uncomfortably close scrutinizer of all my activities, who believed that hypnosis was tampering with the soul, West complained. Gottlieb's reply came on letterhead from Chemrophil Associates, a front company he used to correspond with MK Ultra subcontractors. My good friend, he wrote, I had been wondering whether your apparent rapid and comprehensive grasp of our problems could possibly be real. You have indeed developed an admirably acute picture of exactly what we are after. For this I am deeply grateful. He would arrange top-secret clearances for anyone who might become ensnared in their work, giving West a separate sum for the purchase of materials. Gottlieb saluted his new recruit. We have developed quite an asset in the relationship we are developing with you. West returned the camaraderie. It makes me very happy to realize that you consider me an asset, he replied. Surely there is no more vital undertaking conceivable in these times. With that, the record of their correspondence ceased for nearly nine months. When it resumed in April 1954, West had begun arrangements to relocate to the University of Oklahoma School of Medicine, which wanted him to head its psychiatry department. He would be a civilian again. Gottlieb commended his new look, noting, it appears at the moment to be a move which would in the long run be beneficial for us. He signed off intimately, give my regards to your family. West had lied to his prospective employer, writing, My present job is purely clinical, and I have been doing no research, classified or otherwise. The university took him at his word. Now performing his duties for Gottlieb at both the university and the Air Force Base, West asked the judge advocate at Lackland for permission to accept money from the Geschichte Fund for Medical Research, which he called a nonprofit private research foundation. In fact, 
As the CIA later acknowledged, Geschichte was another of Gottlieb's fictions, enabling him to keep West and other researchers properly paid. By April 1955, West had moved permanently to Oklahoma City. But the Air Force insisted he return to Lackland weekly to serve out the remainder of his contract. Gottlieb, who had evidently attempted to pull some strings, wrote in September 1954 to relay some frustrating news. The Air Force will not release you. Although this rather adequately stops our present effort, it does not erase the need for research in the field. I'm suggesting, therefore, that you give some thought to the period some 20 months hence and the plans which might be made in the interim. 20 months would have put them in April 1956. That year, West reported back to the CIA that the experiments he'd begun in 1953 had at last come to fruition. He was ensconced in a civilian institution, and evidently he found it a less oppressive setting than Lackland had been. In a paper titled The Psychophysiological Studies of Hypnosis and Suggestibility, he claimed to have achieved the impossible. He knew how to replace true memories with false ones in human beings without their knowledge. In case the CIA didn't grasp the significance of this, he put it in layman's terms. It has been found to be feasible to take the memory of a definite event in the life of an individual and through hypnotic suggestion bring about the subsequent conscious recall to the effect that this event never actually took place, but that a different, fictional event actually did occur. The document, marked classified, was right there in West's files. I had to assume that the CIA had destroyed any copies. They've never publicly acknowledged West's groundbreaking deed. He'd done it, he claimed, by administering new drugs effective in speeding the induction of the hypnotic state and in deepening the trance that can be produced in given subjects. As in his initial experiments, West performed most of these psychiatric feats on mental health patients. The necessity to obtain most of the subject material from a population of psychiatry patients made standardized observations very difficult, he groused. In the report, which doubled as a request for continued funding, a successful request, West received government backing through 1965 at the least, he enthusiastically described a high-tech laboratory he planned to construct at Oklahoma. It would include a special chamber where various hypnotic, pharmacologic, and sensory environmental variables will be manipulated. West had hypnotized mental patients and normal subjects and exposed them to a host of drugs, including chlorpromazine, recipine, amphetamines, and LSD, the same ones that David Smith would inject in his confined rodents about a decade later. Of course, at least two of these, LSD especially, would prove instrumental in the Manson family's group psychology. But when it came to elaborating on his findings about implanting memories and controlling thoughts, West skimped on the details. He seemed to have been in a rudimentary phase of his research. Acid, he wrote, made people more difficult to hypnotize. It was better to pair hypnosis with long bouts of isolation and sleep deprivation. Using hypnotic suggestion, he claimed, a person can be told that it is now a year later, and during the course of this year many changes have taken place, so that it is now acceptable for him to discuss matters that he previously felt he should not discuss. An individual who insists he desires to do one thing will reveal that secretly he wishes just the opposite. Since West's paper was light on specifics, it's hard to know if it was only a ploy for more funding. Whatever it was, the CIA felt it had to keep it under wraps. When the agency was forced to disclose MK Ultra to the public, they submitted an expurgated version of West's paper to Congress, an act of deception that's never been exposed. At the National Security Archives in D.C., I found the version of the psychophysiological studies of hypnosis and suggestibility that the CIA had turned over to the Senate. West's name and affiliation were redacted, as expected. But what shocked me was that the Senate's version 
didn't include West's nine-page attachment, but rather an unsigned summary. There was no mention of West's triumphant accomplishment, the replacement of the memory of a definite event in the life of an individual with a fictional event. In sworn testimony, the CIA said that everything it shared with Congress was intact except for the redactions of researchers' and institutions' names. Now it turned out they hadn't just censored West's report. They'd completely misrepresented its contents. The one-page summary of West's accomplishments in the lab doesn't exist in West's original. The new page was only a theoretical discussion of LSD, of its possible effects on dissociative states. It concluded, the effects of these agents, LSD and other drugs, upon the production, maintenance, and manifestations of disassociative states has never been studied. West, of course, had studied those effects for years and years. I could only conclude that the CIA misrepresented the original document to mislead the Senate committee, thus striking West's research from the official record. As was my habit whenever I found hard evidence of a cover-up, I started dwelling on one question after another. Didn't this counterfeit paper cast doubt on the entire cache of documents released to the Senate in 1977? If West's authentic paper had been so fuzzy about the effects of drugs, including LSD, on disassociative states, why had the CIA felt the need to generate a fake version? Maybe because West had achieved one of MK Ultra's most coveted goals. Despite testimony to the contrary, the CIA had, in fact, learned how to manipulate people's memories without their knowledge. Agency officials claimed the program had been a colossal failure, leading newspapers to run mocking headlines like the gang that couldn't spray straight. It could have been exactly what the agency wanted, for the world to assume MK Ultra was a bust and forget the whole thing. One thing was indisputable. The CIA's falsified documents invalidated the Senate investigation's findings. The agency lied, obstructed justice, and tampered with evidence. And the West documents prove it. Given the furtive nature of his research, West could be surprisingly garrulous. Among the press clippings in his file were two items from Portland, Oregon newspapers both dated October 1963, the murky period between his Oklahoma hypnosis studies and the Haight-Ashbury project. West had given an address to the Mental Health Association of Oregon, letting it slip that he was inducing insanity in the lab. He framed these studies as positive developments. They might someday cure mental illness. We are at the dawning of a new era, West told the crowd, learning for the first time to produce temporary mental derangement in the laboratory. The Oregon Journal noted that West listed the new hallucination drug LSD, along with other drugs, hypnosis, and sleep deprivation, as some of the things that he was using to produce temporary mental illness effects in normal people. Reporting that West had done extensive work with LSD, the journal continued, the most important contribution of the drug so far is in producing model mental illnesses. Almost 15 years later, besieged by reporters after the New York Times alleged that he'd taken part in MKUltra's secret LSD experimentation program, West insisted that all of his LSD work had been confined to animals, denying any CIA affiliation. When reporters pointed out that he'd received an awful lot of money from the agency, he retorted that he'd had no idea that the Geschichte Fund and other sources were CIA fronts. Legally, the CIA was obligated to tell the University of Oklahoma that one of its faculty had been on the agency payroll. Oklahoma revealed a heavily redacted memo saying that an unnamed professor, West, I confirmed through financial records, had been investigating a number of disassociative phenomena on humans in the lab including an exceptionally rare clinical disorder known as LATA, a neurotic condition marked by automatic obedience. None of the allegations harmed West's reputation.
By then, he'd left Oklahoma for UCLA, where he offered a steady stream of denials and continued to thrive through his retirement in 1988. Irascible and arrogant, he was quick to threaten lawsuits when anyone brought up the charges. Sometimes he threw in diversionary tactics. In a 1991 rebuttal, he claimed, my secret connection to Washington, D.C. is not as a spook, but rather as a confidential advisor to presidents. From Eisenhower to Bush, Democrat and Republican presidents alike have freely sought and received my counsel. In a 1993 letter to the editor of the UCLA Bruin, he had the temerity to compare his accusers to Nazi propagandists. In Goebbels' tradition of the big lie, West added, I have never taken part in mind control experiments funded by the CIA or anybody else. A statement belied by his own files. The Misadventures of Jolly West Even before his CIA connections came out, West's experiments got him in plenty of trouble. In 1972, he announced plans to build a lab in an abandoned Nike missile base in the Santa Monica Mountains. He would call it the Center for the Study and Reduction of Violence, or the Violence Center for short. There, in perfect isolation, he could study the origins and control of human violence by experimenting on prisoners. Governor Ronald Reagan gave the Violence Center a full-throated endorsement. But West's proposal for grant money landed him in hot water. He planned to test radical forms of behavior modification implanting electrodes and remote monitoring devices in prisoners' brains. A federal investigation concluded that the program involved coercive methods that threatened privacy and self-determination. The committee's disclosures stymied the violence center before it got past the planning stages. The California legislature vetoed the project. UCLA's student body rose up in protest of West. And this, to reiterate, was before anyone had a clue about his CIA work. Now I could tie West to the highest, most clandestine echelons of the Central Intelligence Agency. I could tie him to both of the Smiths, the authority figures from Manson's lost year in San Francisco. And through his efforts to open the violence center, I could tie him to bigwigs in the LAPD and the DA's office who'd helped to prosecute Manson but I could never prove that he'd examined Manson himself, or even that they'd ever met. Nor had West taken part in Manson's trial. His absence was conspicuous. One of the world's leading experts on brainwashing and cults, he was hardly averse to publicity. He'd appeared as a witness many times before. Manson was tried in his own backyard. The proceedings were international news. Yet West went nowhere near them. I told David Smith about the CIA's research and its parallels with Manson. The agency had wanted to accomplish exactly what Manson succeeded in doing with the girls. I was wondering whether someone in the CIA influenced Manson while he was in San Francisco. I don't know, he said. But the military experiments are added proof that my hypothesis is correct, that it can be done. That you can brainwash with LSD? He nodded. The CIA maintained that they never were able to accomplish it, I said. In part because they were basically taking normal subjects, he said, not susceptible girls in a reinforcing environment. When he'd evaluated Susan Atkins for a parole hearing ten years after she'd separated from Manson, she was still under his control. I can't get him out of my head, she told him. He's still in my brain. But was brainwashing really even possible? I'd always believed that Cold War-era paranoia had overstated the potential for Manchurian candidates, taught to kill by dastardly commies. On the other hand, I accepted that Charles Manson had altered his followers' minds, and that LSD did a lot of the heavy lifting. He'd seemed to have an endless supply of the drug, though no one said how he got it. Plus, he was so often described as hypnotic. Ed Sanders had written in The Family of a Hypnotist, William Denier, 
who managed a Sunset Strip Club and alleged that he'd taught Manson how to hypnotize. It seemed dubious. But I confirmed that Denier had learned hypnosis in the Navy, and his daughter told me she'd seen her father teaching Manson at the club. With Alan Shefflin, a forensic psychologist and law professor who'd written a book on MK Ultra, I laid out a circumstantial case linking West to Manson. Was it possible, I asked, that the Manson murders were an MK Ultra experiment gone wrong? No, he said. An MK Ultra experiment gone right. In the back of my mind was the most confounding passage in Helter Skelter, one that I'd underlined, highlighted, and finally torn out and taped above my computer. The most puzzling question of all, Bugliosi wrote, was how Manson had turned his docile followers into remorseful killers. Even with the LSD, the sex, the isolation, the sleep deprivation, 